joining us for the Positive Coaching webinar. Uh, obviously, tonight we're going to hear from Nick Maxwell from the Collingwood Football Club on team culture and, and leadership. Uh, my name's David Roberts. I'm from the Tro Valley Authority, part of the Victorian State Government, and I'm going to act as our MC uh, for the night. So before we go any further, we'd just like to acknowledge the tradition, traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet. And for those of us in Gippsland, that's the Gunai Kurnai people. I'd like to pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, as well as acknowledge any First Nation people that have joined us tonight. Also, I'd like to acknowledge the organisations that have assisted in bringing these sessions uh, to us. Firstly, our sporting partners, Collingwood Football Club. We've got Melbourne Victory coming up in a few weeks and the Melbourne Boomers. Also, a big thanks to Gipps Sport, which is our regional sports assembly for Gippsland, Basketball Victoria Country, AFL Gippsland and Netball Victoria that have all um, assisted us in put this, putting this together. Uh, tonight, we have close to 100 people joining us or registered, so we're probably sitting at about 50 or so at the moment. So it's important for us to keep our webcams off and our microphones on mute. As I said earlier, it's great to be able to chat in the chat room. It's a great way to stay engaged in the session, to share your ideas, comments, feedback with other participants. Uh, and learning from each other is, is just as important as um, hearing from, from people like Nick tonight. So please join in the discussions and be respectful of people's opinions and comments. Uh, we don't expect Nick to uh, monitor the chat room during the presentation, so both Ryan and myself will keep an eye on the chat room and we'll um, put some questions to Nick at the end of the session. And um, talking about Ryan, before we get on to Nick, we'll um, introduce Ryan Evans from Gippsport. I think he's got his club presence hat on for this first presentation uh, and he'll give us a bit of a local presentation. So happy to hand over to you, Ryan. Thanks, David, and uh, good evening, everyone. Just bear with me for a moment while I share my screen here and get this going. Um, hopefully that slide's working for everybody. Yeah, can certainly see that. Beautiful, okay. So um, I'm only going to be making a short presentation this evening, just shy of 10 minutes or so. Uh, I'll then be passing over to our guest speaker, Ian Nick. So there is a bit I'd like to cover, though, in that time. So I might kick things off tonight by quickly touching on uh, culture, uh, what a positive culture is and the importance of creating an appropriate culture, not only within your individual teams, but um, in your club as a whole. As David mentioned, my name's Ryan Evans, and as well as being a program coordinator at Gippsport, I'm also the president of a local football netball club. And after being heavily involved in governing the club over a number of years, I really can't express enough how important, I believe, uh, it is to create a welcoming, inclusive and positive culture at your club. Uh, the culture of a club can be a major determinant in the success that a club uh, and individual teams uh, have both on and off the field. And perhaps most importantly, uh, having a strong and positive culture at your club plays a, a large part in ensuring that people have a, a positive and, and a pleasant experience and continue to return to the club. So now developing a successful club culture is often discussed in clubs. However, this is often done without a clear idea of what it actually requires. So. I'm going to start by considering what is club culture and what does this actually mean? What uh, everyone needs to firstly understand is that club culture involves so much more than just on-field success. Uh, the culture of your club is reflected in the attitudes, values and beliefs uh, that club members hold and the subsequent practices that are put in place. Um, good club culture means considering and enforcing uh, things such as uh, your code of conduct, uh, risk management strategies, uh, your member protection guidelines, things like that to ensure that everyone has a fun, safe and an inclusive experience. So what does a club with a good culture look like? Well, I've jotted down a few things here and I've split it into clubs with strong cultures and ones with weak cultures. So if we're looking at a club with a strong culture, I consider that one to be one that is welcoming, safe and fun to be involved with. Uh, it involves uh, well-supported volunteers, uh, is community focused, and there are opportunities for player, coach, and volunteer development. Uh, a club with a strong club culture is inclusive and supportive. Uh, there'd be positive spectator behaviour and engages parents and other family members. Uh, conversely, a club with a weak culture uh, has low involvement from club members, players, and parents, uh, regular poor behaviour. It maintains a win at all cost attitude. Uh, it has poor spectator behaviour, high dropout and low retention rates, and a poor community profile. A club with a weak club culture is not inclusive and does not have appropriate policies or guidelines in place. Um, there are a hell of a lot of sporting clubs out there, and I've seen plenty from both camps in, in the four years I've been at Gippsport, as well as a lot of other clubs I've been involved with. But I know as a club leader now which type I'm aiming my club to be. And the reason is simple. Um, the benefits of having a good club culture 
they're boundless. Uh, it can, for instance, result in things like uh, the creation of a safe, welcome, inclusive environment um, and of a positive image of the club as well. Uh, the attraction of new members or sponsors, uh, the club becoming a place where people want to spend their time and the club becoming more respected by local community uh, and, uh, and other clubs as well. Um, over the past few seasons, my club committee has spent a lot of time working hard behind the scenes to improve our culture and create a more inclusive environment. And we're now really starting to see the benefits both on and off the field. Uh, last year on the field, uh, our senior footy team made it to the grand final for the first time in 17 years. Uh, unfortunately, the boys couldn't quite put it together on the day, but it was good just to be out there um, uh, playing for a cup again. Uh, thankfully, uh, our reserves team did uh, get the job done and we're looking forward to, to football and netball again in 2021. I also made the conscious decision a couple of years back to introduce a women's football team and are now one of only eight clubs in Gippsland to field a women's football side. And, and over the last two years, this team has gone through both seasons as undefeated premiers and champions. So we've had a pretty good couple of years. Um, while this is great, it's probably the stuff that's happening off the field that's the most satisfying. Um, there are more and more women and girls in particular uh, getting in touch with us wanting to join the female teams. So we also have a, a youth girls side as well. Uh, and I've already had a couple of male players making contact with me in regards to joining uh, our men's team for the 21 season. So it's pretty handy because it's going to save me um, some actively recruiting uh, like I normally do uh, around this time of year. Um, we've also uh, hosted Orange Round Games, um, promoting gender equity, Pride Round Games, supporting the LGBTQI community uh, and mental health rounds as well. And, and as a result, we're, we're seeing more and more people through the gates uh, on the weekends. Uh, with the, and a lot of football netball clubs have, have always had a, a probably a drinking culture associated and with with a, um, the blokey drinking culture having been reined in a bit uh, in addition to the two new female teams we've also been able to attract new sponsors which has been great and, and also other finding opportunities and uh, would you believe it we've uh, even improved our relationship with the umpires i know in my time at the club we've, we've never had a positive relationship with the umpires it's probably due to um, some of the abuse they've got from some of our more verbal supporters at times. But uh, last season, our club won the most disciplined club award, which is actually chosen by the Umpires Association. So it's been quite an amazing turnaround from, from the strained relationship we had. So and I, I put a lot of this, I put down to the fact that we've been able to just amend the culture around the club a, a hell of a lot. Um, I want to touch on a couple of other things and creating a positive culture won't happen overnight. Uh, there are several actions that clubs can take to work towards creating a, a positive culture though. Uh, firstly, at your next committee or your coaches meeting, I'd suggest perhaps discussing some key values that you think the club or team should have. Um, this really sets the tone for the direction you take. Uh, you know, what does a club stand for, or the team stand for, what is and isn't considered acceptable behaviour. Um, also, make sure that you get the ideas and input from everyone at the club, um, not just your players and officials. You can even go one step further, as I've listed there, and reach out to the community. Um, ask how they perceive um, how they see you and your club, because their views are likely to differ from, from those of the club themselves. A um, couple of other things to consider, and I'd be also considering the diversity of your club. Uh, is the club welcoming and inclusive of all ages, abilities, cultures and genders? Uh, how are alcohol and drugs managed within the club? Uh, is the club connected to the good sports program, for instance? Uh, does it have an illegal drug policy in place? And is the club a child safe environment that meets the child safe standards? Um, there are also a number of other important uh, issues to consider when it comes to club culture. Uh, firstly, the, you know, the development of volunteer recognition and support strategies. So, you know, things like are your volunteers efforts acknowledged? Um, are they assisted to develop their capabilities? Uh, are there opportunities for them to undertake training or work with more experienced club members? Um, also, does your club have a code of conduct or code of expected behaviours in place for its players, um, committee members, coaches and supporters? And most importantly, is this club enforced? Uh, is, sorry, this code enforced? Um, and are women and girls made to feel comfortable in your club? Are the female teams acknowledged as much as their male counterparts? Um, and do they have a voice when it comes to clubs making decisions? Uh, just before I finish up, uh, I just wanted to also quickly mention the roadmap for implementing and shaping your club culture. Uh, there are a couple of things, loose as the stages here on the PowerPoint that I'd like you to consider. So stage one is obviously to make an attempt to establish an appropriate club or a team culture, if that's what you're looking at. Um, determine what you want your club or your team to look like. Uh, as I said, establishing a positive culture, it won't happen overnight. It is hard work and there will likely be setbacks you need to overcome. But You've got to make sure you take that first step. Um, through making an attempt, 
to establish a positive club or a team culture, though, you should be able to identify uh, your strengths and, and areas of development. Uh, you know, what do you have in place that's already working? Um, what are some areas that, that uh, you know you need to improve? Uh, you also need to establish a plan for support. Um, what we put in place to support good culture, uh, for instance, the use of appropriate policies, uh, the recruitment of appropriate people in the key roles, uh, and appropriate communication strategies to ensure that everyone understands what you're trying to do and, and is on board for the ride. Uh, lastly, if you're not happy with your current club or your team culture and would like to establish a more positive culture, then it will involve some change. And uh, with any form of change, you'll normally face some barriers. And uh, most often these are from people who may not share your vision or they might have strong opinions about how things have always been done. Um, they might not uh, acknowledge the need for change or say that they have too much on their plate already to make any change. So important to be prepared for this. Um, so I've got a few suggestions which might help you overcome some of these barriers. So I'd firstly suggest sharing your ideas with, with others on the committee or the playing leadership uh, group members or, you know, your selection committee, you know, that might be more open and supportive of any calls you decide to make before you present them to that wider audience. Um, also, give examples of the benefits of a change or other clubs that may have been successful, or perhaps use new legislation that may have come in to make change so that there's a legal or financial reason. So, example of this is, you know, your child safe standards, which came in a few years back, or, or the value of female participation at your club. Uh, also, perhaps try and work out a plan for how any additional work um, caused by any change can be shared across the committee or coaching panel so you're prepared when, when you're actually ready to do the, do the work. Um, so that's it from me. As I said, I'll be quite quick. Uh, hopefully, though, this introduction to creating a positive club culture has given you a bit to think about. Um, I'll shortly be passing you over to Nick, but in closing, I just wanted to let you know that um, Gip Sport is here to help, and we have a number of resources available for clubs. Uh, these include, you know, things like um, sample codes of conduct, uh, child safe policies, gender equity policies, uh, legal drug policies, you know, racial vilification, discrimination policies, the whole heap. We've got we've got a wide range of resources. So if you need any assistance in this in this area, make sure you make contact with me or another uh, member of Gibbs Sport. Um, one thing I wanted to finish on though is remember though policies are only as effective if they're used to guide decision making. It's no good adopting appropriate policies if they're not going to be followed. So I work with a lot of clubs and they get these nice SWIC um, policies, but they're put in a filing cabinet and never used, so they must be followed. So make sure if you put policies in that that's what, what you do. Um, that is it from me. I've listed my details there on the, the slide in case there is anyone that'd like to get in contact with me at any stage after tonight's webinar. Um, I will now uh, introduce you to our guest speaker for the evening, and that is uh, Nick Maxwell. Um, I'm sure that uh, you all would remember Nick from his playing days with the Collingwood Football Club. Nick uh, played with the Pies between 2004 and 2014, uh, leading the team with distinction for five years between 2009 and 2013. And this, of course, included the, the 2010 Premiership year. Uh, Nick announced his retirement from football in July 2014, having played a total of 208 games, uh, including 103 as captain in the black and whites. And in November 2014, uh, Nick joined NRL club Melbourne Storm as a club's leadership development coach. Uh, the role saw him work at the club for one day a week, overseeing Storm's emerging leadership program and developing uh, the off-field preparation skills of the younger players in the NRL squad. Uh, Nick also assisted head coach Craig Bellamy in working with the senior leadership group. Uh, two years later, in November 2015, he joined AFL club Greater Western Sydney Giants as part of the club's leadership program. And in 2017, Nick returned to Collingwood, taking on a newly created position as a Magpies leadership and cultural manager. Uh, he also joined BBL team, the Melbourne Stars, in 2018 to observe and provide advice on the club's leadership program. Uh, Nick is one of the most respected leaders in sport today, and we're very grateful for having him join us here tonight. So thanks, Nick. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thank you for having me and, uh, and for everyone for giving up their Wednesday nights to, to come and listen to me talk. Um, you find me in a hub. Uh, obviously, the AFL, things have changed due to the, the COVID um, rules, I suppose, going on in Victoria. So um, for everyone back there in Victoria, um, particularly those in Melbourne, um, I really feel for you and uh, for what's going on there. So hopefully everyone stays safe. Um, currently, we're uh, up in Queensland and uh, we've been, I guess we've moved around a fair bit. Uh, we had about 12 hours notice. Uh, we thought we were leaving on a Monday. On uh, We got told on a Friday we were leaving on a Monday to go uh, away for 32 days. 
Um, most of us packed for, for 32 days max. And uh, as we find out later on, we um, were leaving the next morning. Um, so it's been a bit of a whirlwind trying to get everything right and, uh, and head up here and leave a lot of families and loved ones behind. But um, fortunately enough, uh, the Collingwood Footy Club, with the support of the AFL, allowed a lot of us to bring our families up here. So uh, we, after a week in Sydney, uh, three weeks in Perth, uh, we, we finally got up here to Queensland, the Sunshine Coast, and lucky enough to have uh, my family up here at the moment. So, um, yeah, it's good to actually, I guess, have them around uh, for, for about a month before they head back to Victoria, and hopefully things have improved by the time we get back there. Um, look, I've got uh, a little presentation to share with you, and um, for me... I just want to, I don't want to just talk in front of you. I think everyone should be able to see that. You can see that, Ryan, okay? Yep, all good. Oh. Yep. Um, and as I go through this, I'm not going to talk uh, the whole time just about um, my story because I want you to reflect. Um, you've got the answers. You're all in leadership positions or coaching positions, and uh, that's the reason why you give up your Wednesday night to, to listen to someone talk about this. So um, I'd rather actually ask you appropriate questions so it makes you reflect yourself. So... Hopefully you've got a notebook and pen handy um, and we can go through some stuff for you so you can reflect on and take back. Really, basically, um, agenda-wise, I'm just going to talk a bit about my story and then, as I said, I'll ask you to reflect. I'll touch on team culture and then also just want to show you a short uh, video about legacy um, that really that I use a lot uh, and it makes made me think a lot and it made a lot of people that I work with think. So um, I'm going to just drop that for a start just to uh, – where's my sharing button? There we go, just so you can see my face while I talk. Um, just in terms of my story, obviously, even Ryan just went through, I guess, my football career. But I think the a lot of what you learn in your actual journey is before that. And that's quite often the things we don't talk about because everyone wants the bells and whistles of AFL football and what goes on there. But um, for me, I grew up in Geelong. So uh, much like those who are coming from Gippsland, more of a country town, although it has grown since. Um, and all I wanted to do from a young age was play AFL football. I loved AFL football. Um, but being from down there, like you are from Gippsland, with the, with the power, you weren't really seen as anyone who's going to make it as an AFL player unless you're part of Geelong Falcons uh, lineup. And the first opportunity came for me. Got a letter in the mail as well as uh, about 100 others um, to join them for training as a 14-year-old. Uh, and every week they'd, just, they'd cut that squad back um, each week. So you sort of 10 get cut and 10 get cut and, Got down to a night before they announced the squad and I was cut. Um, a guy called Jimmy Bartell, who was uh, just as good as he was uh, in his AFL career, he was just as good at the age of 14, 15. Um, he, he went to the right and I was asked to stay behind and, and sure enough, I was cut. The next year as a 15-year-old, I went through the same process and Jimmy went to the left and I went to the right and got cut. Um, as a 16-year-old, I tried out with the under-18s uh, and at that stage, um, you know, again, went through a similar process and, and got cut. But it was, so I guess, playing AFL football wasn't looking real good for me after three strikes. But um, it was at that stage, and we talk about club culture, um, that I was training with under-18s and the senior coach um, of St. Joseph's Football Club, where I, where I uh, spent all my juniors, he asked me to start training with the senior players of St. Joseph's. And for me, growing up, for, for those of you who are a bit, a bit older, I don't know anyone who was in front of me, but... For those of you who are a bit older, you'd recognise that um, every game wasn't telecast like it is these days. Um, there'd be Friday night footy and there'd be a, maybe a Saturday afternoon or a Saturday night. Um, so I grew up in Geelong, but I broke for Hawthorne. So we weren't driving from Ocean Grove to Waverley Park to watch Hawthorne play and back. It was basically a full day. So most of my Saturdays were spent at my local footy club at St Joey's. So my heroes were the senior players there. They were the guys I looked up to. I'd go out at quarter time after... Uh, so I'd play, obviously, during the day. and watch the reserves play, walk out at quarter time. I'd stand in the huddle when uh, the coach is giving his speech next to these guys. I'm looking up to them, and they were my heroes. They're the ones I looked up to. So when I was asked to start training with them at the age of 16, um, I was petrified for a start. Um, but also, I didn't want to make a mistake and let them down because they were the ones I looked up to. So I trained the under-18s from four till five. And then from five till six, I just put in a lot of practice for about an hour before the senior players would start training. And it helped me a lot. I improved a lot. I was doing um, everything I could to try and get better because I didn't want to let down these guys I looked up to who were my heroes. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to play one game as a 16-year-old. Um, we lost by 120 points, so I was duly dropped the next week. It wasn't all my fault, um, but it was a great experience. And, um, but, and I got that taste for it. And as I said, I improved a lot. I got a lot of fit because I was doing a lot of extra training. So at the end of that year, I played in the under-18s premiership. Uh, and at the end of that year, I got invited back down to the Falcons again. 
and I spent um, went through that whole preseason, uh, all the time trials. I was winning them all, despite the fact I was still bottom age. Um, and I was all the feedback was really positive that yeah, you're gonna you're gonna make the squad this year. Got to the first intra club practice match, um, and I grabbed the ball in the first couple of minutes. I handballed it off. I went to put on a shepherd, and a guy jumped into my back and stuck his knee in my spine and snapped a vertebrae in my back. So. At 17 year old, obviously a uh, young body, um, I was out for six months and, and couldn't play while that healed. So I was cut from the Falcons again. Um, I came back at the end of the year uh, and played in the under 18s of St. Joey's again, but I'd, I'd missed out on the Falcons four times in four goes. Uh, for a fifth time, they invited me back down and uh, I finally made the squad. I played every game. Um, we had a pretty reasonable team. We had Luke Hodge, Gary Ablett, Jimmy Bartell, Brent Maloney, Matt McGuire, Luke Mullen, Luke Vogels, Tom Davidson, Joel Reynolds, Tim Boyle. We had about 13 guys end up on an AFL list from that one team. And amongst those players, I won the best player in finals. So all of a sudden, I had AFL clubs coming and interviewing me, interviewing my parents, my school teachers, my principal, my coaches, as they do these days, just to try and find out every bit of information they could about me. Um, and... In the end, I missed out on the draft, but I had eight clubs ring the next morning that wanted me to go train for a this position with them. So I sat down with my coach and, and the uh, the GM uh, at the Falcons, and we decided I'd go to Port Adelaide. Um, reason was they had aging defenders, so they had, had to start bringing through some youth. Um, but also they had, um, I guess, for me to show as an 18-year-old, I was prepared to move into state and leave my family, which show them how serious I was and how much it meant to me. So I went over there, um, I met uh, Choco Williams and I walked in the door, the coach, um, and he was the one who'd really pushed him to, to go and get me. Uh, I walked in to see the doctor and I'd been carrying a groin in injury at the end of the year um, and I had some scans with me. So they took me for a medical and the doctor put the scans up on the wall and he said, mate, you got osteitis pubis, we can't pick you. Um, and at this stage, this is 2001, no one had ever had osteitis pubis in history. They only had groin injuries and then all of a sudden every second player had it. And... Um, yeah, it was an overuse injury because I was playing uh, for my school on a Wednesday. I was playing for the Falcons on a Saturday and then training a few times and my body just couldn't handle it. So um, I, I, they, they basically had an argument in front of me or an argument slash meeting with the coach, the GM and the doctor. Um, and they said, listen, we can't pick you because we don't know how to treat this injury. We've had some players who have had it and we just we can't fix it. So... I managed to convince them to let me stay for the week because um, they'd already booked my flights, my accommodation, everything. And I still, in the back of my head, I'm pretty stubborn. Uh, I thought, I'll prove you wrong, I'll show you. And I kept training anyway despite the injury, but also just observed and took a lot of notes. And I was just watching Chad Corns and Kane Corns and Treadray and Primus and the Carr brothers and how they went about um, their actual their training how they went about their weights how they interacted and i was taking notes all the time just because i thought all right that's that's the cream of the crop that's where i want to get to so i learned a lot just watching them got back on a saturday and um i i rang the hawthorne football club who were one of those original eight because i knew that luke hodge had the same injury and they just took him to pick one so i thought well they obviously haven't got the same fear that the port have so Um, and I got to the day before the rookie draft and they, they sat me down and said, there's four, four of you, but there's only two positions. In order, we rate you John Beds, our number one, Nick Stone's our number two, myself was number three, and Michael George Artis, number four. They said, we've only got two picks, but um, the Kangaroos have got a pick before us and we think they're going to pick John Baird. If that happens, then we're going to pick uh, Nick Stone and you. So I left there pretty excited that um, I go to the club that I baked, uh, grew up barracking for, but also I had obviously a mate there in Hodgie who uh, who I'd played with that previous season. So sure enough, the Kangaroos picked John Baird, Hawks picked Nick Stone, and then with their next pick, they picked Michael Georgiatis, the fourth one. And I only found out like, when I was commentating for Channel 7, sort of towards the end of my career, I ran in, I walked into the lift and I, I ran into the recruiting officer and had a conversation with him and I said, the first, last time I'd seen him, and I said, um, things actually worked out really well for me, but but what happened? And he said, um, well, Peter Schwab actually had a last-minute call at the draft table. We, we were ready to take you, but um, the player, Michael George Yaris, had played for Box Hill, which is Hawthorne Reserves. Um, so he'd seen him play all year, and he'd never even seen me train because I was in rehab, So, which is absolutely fair enough. So a bit of a sliding doors moment. 
because I hadn't been part of that Falcon system until my last year, um, my dad's a builder, my brother's a builder. I couldn't hang a picture frame, so I knew that I wouldn't be going down that um, that pathway. So I worked pretty hard at school. I got the uh, the enter score I needed to get into Ballarat University and, and do a double degree up there. So I left home and moved up there. Um, and I played for North Ballarat Roosters in the VFL. I wanted to play the highest level of footy I could and, and obviously do my university and Worked several jobs, worked at the Lakeview Hotel, pouring pots and uh, been a bartender there um, at the bottle shop. I worked at the Complete Garden selling fountains and pots and pans and all that sort of stuff, um, flowers. Uh, I worked, I got paid 150 bucks a game to play VFL footy for North Ballarat. Uh, and I worked at um, doing yard duty for year eight kids at Ballarat and Clarendon College, which uh, certainly taught me patience because, uh, as you know, some of the year eight kids can be, can be smart asses. So... Um, I had one of the best years of my life, really enjoyed it. I've still got friends from that year, um, from that one year there that are lifelong friends. But I got towards the end of that season and um, and Geelong rang me up and asked me to come and train with them for a look at this position. So I went down there and trained with the Cats um, for uh, for almost just under a month. And it was just before, about three or four days before Christmas when uh, the rookie draft was because they'd been one of the clubs had some salary cap issues. So it got pushed back. and. <clears throat> Bomber sat me down in his office, the coach, and, and said, mate, we're not going to draft you and we're not going to rook you, um, but we want you to play on our top-up list, um, which for those who don't know what a top-up list is, you have, say, 44 at this stage, 44 in your AFL list, 22 play AFL, the rest play VFL, but obviously you've got injuries, so you can't fill that whole VFL team, so you use top-ups to, to play. Um, so if you've got 40 players available, then obviously the last 18 um, will play in the VFL, and then you need four more from your top-up. So effectively, if they had all their defenders available, then I'd be playing local footy for St. Joey's, which I love, but I was already playing VFL football at, at North Ballarat. So I said, I appreciate that, but um, I'm already playing VFL footy and, and it just doesn't make sense to me. Like, why would I go back when there's a risk of me going back to GFL footy beyond that? Um, and he said, well, you'll be under right under our nose. We'll be coaching you. Um, we've got great facilities here. We've got the gym here. I was uh, a skinny kid, so they wanted to bulk me up. Um, and and I sort of said, well, I appreciate that, but no, nah, it just doesn't make sense to me. So um, he said, well, if you walk out that door, you're not going to get another opportunity and it'll be all over. And I I, um, I said, yeah, you're probably right, but hopefully I'll prove you wrong. And I shook his hand and I left. Um, I was obviously gutted because uh, there wasn't many at that sort of age at 19, 20 that um, there was no sort of Podsy Adleys and, and Mick Barlow and those guys came a few years later. So there wasn't a lot of players getting drafted after that age group. So I... Um, I was going, uh, I'd finished in Ballarat and it was Christmas time. So I was going to meet all my mates from school for a Christmas beer and I actually got a text message from one of my mates. Uh, Mum was driving me to into town and he said, well done the draft. And I was confused and I rang him up and I said, mate, what, what was that all about? And he said, um, Collingwood picture. And I said, no, no, I haven't, I haven't spoken to Collingwood for, for over 12 months, which was true. And he said, oh, it's on the computer screen in front of me. So this is before everything was live and before it was online. So I... I was sort of confused. I said, no, nah, it might have been a prediction thing, but didn't get picked and um, I'll see you soon for a beer. And I hang up the phone. I had four voicemail messages and I'm looking at my phone. Well, what's going on here? And listen to the first one. It said, this is Noel Judkins recruiting officer from Collingwood. I want to welcome you to the club. I'm like, yeah, of course, he's deleted. I went to the second one. Uh, I just thought all my mates have been in the pub already for a few hours. They've got a head start on me and they've just grabbed some old guy and they're trying to play a prank on me or something. Um, got to the second one and said, this is Mick Moldhouse from the Collingwood Footy Club and I welcome him to the club. And I was like, yeah, of course it is. And I deleted that too. I went down to the third one and it was the player manager that I'd signed with um, 12 months before. And he was screaming down the phone, Peter Lenton, going, yelling at, well done, congratulations, and all excited. And um, and I thought, well, my mates wouldn't even know who he was. And the fourth one was obviously the now coach, but captain at the time, Nathan Buckley. And he was saying, welcome to the club. So all of a sudden, uh, that's how so I found out that I was at Collingwood. And I had a one-year deal as a rookie on a rookie um, wage, so I was on um, 18 grand before tax. So I had to work on my day off uh, at Telstra. So it's not all beer and skittles as an AFL player. Um, but again, that one year I played at Williamstown. That was Collingwood's alliance team, and um, a lot of my career I can thank to the senior players and the coaches at Williamstown Football Club because when you've got an alliance of AFL players coming back, and like I mentioned with Geelong, where you can push out Williamstown players because Collingwood players want to come back or the coach wants them to play certain positions. Um, we just had a great culture at Williamstown. And it was led by Troy West and Brad Lloyd 
Um, we had a lot of AFL, ex-AFL players in Sam Cranage, Marcus Baldwin, Craig Smoker and Adrian Fletcher, um, as well as others. But all these guys really supported us and helped us and made us feel a part of it all. So, um, yeah, we absolutely loved it. Um, the For me, so I got, we went on the premiership that year, actually, in the VFL. The next year, I got another one-year deal. I went into 25 grand, so I stopped uh, working at Telstra. Um, and then from there, I sort of went on to play the, the 200-odd games that, that Ryan mentioned before. So um, the reason I want to share that is because I've experienced a lot of football clubs and I've experienced different journeys, different setbacks um, and different people along the way before I even got to AFL football. And your stories and what you've learned and how you've gone about it are what are going to help all of you in your leadership positions because you can talk to people about this clip that I've found, this article I've read, this book that I've read. But when you share your experiences and you can actually be a bit vulnerable to say, look, this is some of the struggles I've had or this is where I need help from you, my, the people I work with or the people I work for or the people I lead, um, that actually makes it more genuine and it helps them go about what they go, the way they go about it. So um, I'm just going to move on now to, um, to a couple other stories and then I'm going to ask you to share some of yours. So the first one, um, let me get this up, sorry. Uh, this guy, Mervyn Davies, uh, is very successful. Um, he's, he's been the chairman of several massive companies, but um, he said this when he's chairman of Standard Chartered Bank, know yourself, know the people around you, then get on with it. And I think that too often we don't really know ourselves well enough to understand what we are good and good at and things we need to be better at. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my own strengths and weaknesses, and, and then I'm going to ask you to think about your own. So for me, my strengths... Um, I think I build genuine connection. I take the time to invest in people, to get to know them, to work out what makes them tick. Um, and it's not to, um, I guess, take advantage of anyone. It's just so that I know which buttons to press uh, and get an understanding of them and, and um, how I can best support them, how I can help them strive to be the best they can be. Uh, integrity, uh, I think that I do what I say I'm going to do. Um, sometimes that can get me in trouble with my wife because I commit to things. Uh, like a Wednesday night uh, meeting with uh, people I've never met before. <laughs> um, but uh, for me, yeah, j just if I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And um, I guess one example of that, which um, has really stayed with me my whole life, is um, one of my best mates uh, was a school teacher um, at Simmons College in Melbourne. And I went, I went to school with him. And um, in July uh, one year, he actually texted me and said, mate, would you mind coming into the club and, and spending an hour with our youth? students uh, over lunch uh, during finals and I said yeah sure mate a few months away um, just after um, and uh, we'd my daughter had, had a shocking night's sleep uh, and I was up we were sort of up and night with her but it was a day off the next day and uh, my, I finally got to sleep my alarm went off and my wife said no, you can to sleep and I'll look after her and I said no nah, I've got to go see uh, Mick I made a commitment to him and uh, he would I told him I was going to do it. I didn't want to let him down. Um, I went in there, spent an hour with him. Or he had the perfect balance. You know those school teachers you had where the perfect balance between banter with kids but also respect. Um, he had that. And he'd only been a teacher for about 10 months. So I was rapt to see how quickly uh, – I'm not surprised, but how quickly he'd pick that up. Um, that, so it was great actually seeing him in his element, seeing him um, do what he was doing. Uh, that was the last time I ever saw him alive. Um, two months later, uh, three months later, he uh, he died. He was camping at Lake Ildon when a tree fell on him, 24 years old, the whole, his whole life ahead of him. Um, and I wouldn't have got to see him in his element, see him that moment, um, had I not followed through and did what I said I was going to do and, and follow through that commitment. So it's something that's really stayed with me, and I think about it a lot. Um, I guess my other strength is team first. I'll play whatever role I need to play that's going to help whatever team I'm working for. So... Um, excuse me, it's funny going into um, to COVID, we've got a lot less staff and I found myself making protein shakes, delivering lunches to different rooms, um, taking the forwards for different um, training sessions, doing some aerial coaching, still doing the leadership role I'm doing. So you're just doing all different things because we just have to, we've just got to adapt. So whatever's going to help the team. For me, a few of my weaknesses, first one is detail. Uh, I, I struggle with detail. I keep reminding myself to go back and check, reread things, um, to write things down. I'm always organised, but detail is something I, I tend to look ahead at getting the task completed and, and I miss the detail in between. 
and that's sort of also tied into driving too hard. I tend to work at a pretty furious pace and um, often I'll expect others to work at the same pace and I don't think that's fair, but um, I guess that's something that I have to continue to improve and, and be better at. Um, and, and one of my failures as a leader, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this if you really reflect on it, is um, sometimes I'll just go, it's just easier for me to do it myself. So it'll get done right and it'll get done quickly. But if you're in a leadership position, that's not your role. Your role is to actually give other people an opportunity to try and achieve something themselves. So as frustrating as it is watching them make mistakes, that's how they learn. And it's also a bit of an ego thing to go, how do you know that your way is the best way? That might've worked for you, but there might be a more efficient way. There might be a way we can go about it that um, might actually help um, others uh, or might even make it more efficient the way they do it. So you ought to give them that, that opportunity to learn and don't take it out of their hands. So that's something that I have to be better at and, and always remind myself of. So I just want to give you, I'm only going to give you a minute. I've got two minutes there, but I want you to take a minute just to write down uh, your own strengths and weaknesses. You don't have to achieve it all, but uh, you can just start writing down on a piece of paper in front of you. My strengths are, my weaknesses are, and just take a minute to write down a couple of those. And uh, I'll be back in a minute to, to go through on to the next. So you could probably spend 10, 15 minutes on that yourself. Um, and I encourage you to do so in the next sort of 24, 48 hours, um, just to continue to reflect and even ask some people who are close to you, who know you well, what you think your strengths and weaknesses are and, uh, and make sure they're aligned with what you actually think they are. Nick, I think you've muted yourself there somehow. Sorry, there we go, I'm back. Sorry, moving on to the next one. Um, unfortunately, yeah, he's not uh, related to me, John C. Maxwell, because he's made a lot of money uh, as an author, but he says one of the greatest values of mentors is the ability to see ahead what others cannot see and to help them navigate a course to their destination. And as leaders, that's our For me, um, in my development, I just want to talk about some of the people that have helped me. And again, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing so you can have a think about that while I'm talking. But the first one is my parents. Um, my dad, uh, he had his own business uh, from sort of an early age and he actually just retired only a few weeks back, but he's got an incredible work ethic. Um, he would actually uh, leave leave home before we were even awake and, and get home late at night and he would still find time to take us out for a kick of the footy. I'd uh, still find time to give up his weekends to coach our local team or whatever we're doing. And um, his work ethic was something I got from him and, and something I learned from him. Um, another one is his treatment of his staff. So when I was old enough to be able to work uh, out in his factories, I'd actually go out there and, work and to see the way that he treated his staff was something that he, he listened to them. Uh, and then he'd obviously give feedback and work with them. But um, he didn't know it all and he always asked uh, for their opinions and that was something that uh, I really valued and I know that they did. My mum, um, I probably get my empathy from my mum. She's uh, someone who's massive in a charity. She's a big support for everyone that, uh, I guess all her friends and people that she knows well, they all, t they all turn to her and go to her for advice. So um, that's certainly something I met from her. I learned from her. Jared Fitzgerald was the coach that I had in North Ballarat and, uh, and he came at a great time for me the first time only had him for a year, but the first time I moved out of uh, out of home as an 18-year-old, living with three other 18-year-olds, working in, in three different jobs, doing university, and obviously trying to play VFL football, he was always person first, football second. Uh, and that was so important for me at that stage because it, it was challenging for us younger players. I and mean, we had a, a lot of young players come through at that stage. Um, obviously, he, he wanted to coach you and he wanted to make you a great footballer. But he wanted to make sure that you were looked after as a person first and you understood that 
um, or he understood that unless you looked after the individual as a person, the football was never going to never gonna get to the level it needed to get to. So that was something I certainly learned from him. Um, Mick Moldhouse, was, he knew the individual. He knew which buttons to press. Um, he would rip shreds off me in front of the group uh, because he knew for two things. Number one, he knew I'd grip my teeth. I'd go, I'll show you, old man, and I'd go harder. Um, but also he knew that he'd be sending a message to everyone else. <coughs> Excuse me. That, um, yeah, that he'd, he'd go for leader first. And then it makes everyone else aware that I want to look after my own backyard. Um, Craig Bellamy is someone I worked with the last six years, and he's just got an incredible work ethic. And I just want to share one story with you. Um, he he shows the opposition every week who we're coming up against and uh, at the Storm and and the way that they attack. So when they've got the ball, what they do, so that the Storm boys know how we have to defend. Um, he showed a clip and he said. So there's about 50 clips down the side of this presentation. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, and he said, showed all them. There was one just down the bottom separate to him. And he said, I just want to show you one more clip. Um, the reason I want to show it is it was a really dangerous attack. They didn't score off it, but they might roll it out against us. And it's important that you see it. It was from six weeks before. So six weeks before the, one, the game that um, we were playing. And they didn't score off it. So he couldn't go through the archives and just look at every time they scored. He had to actually go back and look at every single minute that they had the ball across the last six weeks. So the work ethic, the attention to detail was just unbelievable. So I think that's why they've been so good for so long. So my question for you is, take a minute, um, who developed you and who mentored you? What did you learn from them? One thing uh, I encourage you to do is to, to have a good think about that because there's obviously a lot of people that have helped you get in the position that you are today. Um, and something that's really powerful, and I've done it with a lot of groups, is when they've actually wrote that person down, is to send a text message or maybe or, or have a phone call to that individual and just say, listen, we were doing a bit of a reflective piece about some positive coaching and how I can improve my coaching and my leadership. And I was asked about who developed me or who mentored me and what I learned from them. And uh, if you imagine you're on the other side of that and you were the person that received a text message from someone you'd worked with years before who actually said, listen, I just want to say that um, you helped me with this, this and this and some of the things you taught me, I still use every day today. So it'd um, be pretty powerful to, uh, to sort of show them that um, that's where you've come. Um, it's not the mounds ahead that wear you down, it's the pebble in your shoe. Uh, Muhammad Ali was pretty good at what he did. Um, and I love this quote because I find I think the pebbles are things that can cause a lot of trouble in culture and they're also uh, the easiest things to fix. So the pebbles in the workplace, um, the storm, you're yeah. late for a meeting, the door closes, the door gets locked. If you're not in there, bad luck. If you're not in there, then obviously you're in big trouble with the coach, um, but also there's a fine system in place. So you don't be late for meetings and, and people really are. At Storm and Collingwood, we have no phones at group meals. So any time we're together to share a meal together, there's no phones allowed. There's a, there's a fine system in place. And that's because we spend so much time on our phones this day, these days that it's good just to actually sit down and have a conversation with people, get to know the people you work with, understand who they are, and not be looking through social media or whatever we're doing uh, for that half an hour when you're actually having a meal together. Um, at both, the cleanliness of facilities is really important. So picking up your cups and your drink bottles, making sure the team room's clean and it's left the way that it, it needs to be for the next group going in. Um, and obviously just general accountability, accountability on standards. Um, pebbles in the workplace, you'd all know what they are. 
um, and I'm sure that I've probably pricked a few uh, minds in terms of interest, in terms of different things that you can think of, and, and there's other things you can think of. Um, I just want to spend a minute for you just to actually write down what are some of the pebbles that you have in your workplace. So what are some of the things? They're only pebbles, but um, they're the pebble in your shoe. So you can still walk to the top of that mountain, but you're going to struggle because those little pebbles in your shoe, they're the easiest things to fix, but these things are about accountability. As you're writing them down, I'm going to share one more story with you, and it's about it's a bit about culture, but it's also a bit about pebbles. When I went back to Collingwood in uh, 2000, end of 2017, um, I got a guest speaker in to talk to our players and he was fascinating, this this guy who was up there. And when he finished, the boys all stood, all clapped and stood up and turned around and walked out of uh, the meeting room. And I sent him a message in their group and I just said, boys, I've never been so embarrassed in my life. I brought someone into our environment. He gave up his time to actually talk to you, to offer you advice. I know you got a lot out of it because I could see you're all attentive and not one of you had the decency to walk up shake his hand, look him in the eye and say, I appreciate you coming in and thank you for your time. Um, and I never spoke about it again. And every single person who's come through as a guest in our facility at any stage in the last three years has commented on um, how pe- everyone comes up, introduces himself, shakes their hand, has a conversation with them. Even the shyest guys we have will go up there, shake hands because they know that that's what we do and that's how we welcome people in our environment. So what became a bit of a pebble um, has actually gone the other way. It's become a part of who we are now. So, um, yeah, I'll give you 30 seconds just to jot down any other pebbles. And I think it's really important that um, you raise these with your teams because the little things are the things that become big things and they're the things that sap your energy. They just um, they, they take so much energy because you're always trying to fix those little things and it, it takes away your focus off the big things. Just moving on, I'm um, going to talk about uh, the actual environment. So leaders create the right environment for the right behaviours to occur. Um, I'm sure anyone who uh, has read Legacy, which is uh, the All Blacks book from many years ago, you would have probably seen that quote and, and heard a bit about Owen Eastwood and how he goes about it. Sorry. Your work environment or your club environment, what's it like? So what's the workplace like? What are your traditions? I'm just going to talk through some of ours um, and might give you some ideas, but also it might actually get you thinking about some of the stuff you already do. So when I went to the Melbourne Storm, um, I had never had any experience. And he's a Samoan kid. And my week uh, of my first season, uh, I walked up to him and he's playing the reserve team. And I said, oh, young, how did you go on the way? He just looked down at his, at, at, his, at the ground, didn't look in the eye, and just said, yeah, yeah, good, good. And I was like, oh, that was, that was a strange conversation. The next week I went and watched his video beforehand and uh, he scored a try. And I saw him from about 10 minutes away. I said, I was really positive in my um, body language. I said, young, young, mate, I saw your try. That was unbelievable as I'm walking towards him. Tell me about it. And all body language opened up and he looked in the eye and he's describing it. You can see the excitement in his face. And I said, mate, can I just ask you a question? Um, last week, this was the interaction we had when you looked at the ground, you looked in the eye. Did I do something? Did I say the wrong thing? And he was like, oh, no, no, Nick. Um, the thing is, you're a coach, so you're senior to me. Um, and the village I come from, you don't look the elders in the eye. So our culture and our respect is not looking you in the eye and looking at your feet. So me coming from a completely different culture, it was two different things. He was being respectful to me and I thought he was being disrespectful. But I had to have that conversation. So we actually started culture night. So every every year we'll have a Tonga night, Samoa night, Kiwi night, Fijian night. And we get the boys to get up and they'll either use um, different traditions that they actually have. So they might cook the food that they've grown up with or they might tell stories about their past or whatever. So... Um, it's great for everyone to get an understanding. After the first year, all the all the uh, Polynesian boys actually said, 
um, we want to do uh, Aussie night because we don't understand half the crap that you guys do. We don't know what you're talking about. We don't understand your slang. So it was great for actually us to do. I was like, hang on, we have to talk about who we are and where we've come from and why we are the way we are. So um, it's obviously been really successful at the Storm. Um, at Collingwood, before COVID, um, we get a pass player back to every home game. We celebrate them. They come into training the day before the game. We get them up and interview them. Um, they come into the box on game day. They're, they're a part of the team again, which is something that I know they really value and our current players really value. So it's a great tradition we have. Um, we have a Mother's Day lunch every year. Again, COVID wrecked it this year, but um, we get all the mums in and give them some champagne and gift baskets and, and shout them lunch. And then they all go to the game together. Um, they're the, uh, when the players run out onto the ground, um, they're the, uh, down the side um, for, for the boys to go run through as they get to the banner. Um, we actually got in trouble uh, from the AFL. Got to please explain last year because um, the players went to run out and they all saw their mums there and they all ran over and gave their mums a hug and a kiss and, and had a little conversation with them. And we were about 30 seconds late going through the banner for the broadcasters. So they weren't too happy with us. But again, it shows that we're, we're trying to help the mother, mums. We're trying to keep them involved. We want to show how much, how important they are to us. Um, at Storm post games um, in the sheds, there'll be different people will come through, different guests. They might sit around and have a beer long break, uh, enjoy the win rather than moving straight on to next week. Um, and obviously functions and different things like that are great traditions that you can have in your workplace or, or in your club. Um, so take a minute, just jot down some of those, um, some of the things that you have in your work environment um, that are really positive or something you've experienced before that maybe you don't have at your current club or something you don't have at your current job um, that you think you might be able to actually bring in because it had such a positive impact in the last one. I'm just conscious of time, so sorry uh, if, you, if I'm rushing you a little bit through those reflection times, but I really want you to, to go back and actually reflect on those questions I've asked you because I think it's really important that you actually think about um, your own journey and where you're coming from and where you want to go. Um, finally, just on team culture, uh, for me, um, and I went through a lot of things about club, this is a bit more about team, and I think what's really important in teams. First one is clarity of roles. Um, everyone wants to know what is my job, what am I responsible for, um, and then the accountability around that. So if I'm doing my job, obviously I want to pat on the back, say, yeah, you're doing your job and, and encourage to keep going along that, that track. If I'm not, tell me what I'm not doing and then tell me what I need to do to do that job. So make me accountable and make me understand what you need from me. Um, and it's crucial that you get that clarity of role so often. Um, if you sit down with someone and say, what are the things you expect of me for me to do my job? It's different to what the leader is thinking. So you have to have that open communication to understand exactly what the role is. And that could be a guy playing um, football or netball on the weekend, or it might be someone you actually work with. It might be your assistant coach to get, well, what message did you give him? What message did you give her? Because that wasn't the message or that wasn't what I meant. And that um, it happens so often. It happens at AFL level, um, happens at NRL, where a, a coach will have a conversation with a player. And if you don't actually say to the player, so explain to me, what you just got out of that, they'll actually say something completely different. And the other, oh, no, no, that's not what the coach meant. The coach meant this. He goes, oh, well, that's not how I took it. So just be really clear in the clarity and the roles um, and obviously the accountability around that. Traditions are really important to your workplace or important to your team. So have as many traditions as you can that are really important that help um, your players or your staff look for um, Values and behaviours, we know uh, before I started was um, what are your values and behaviours, but what are the actions around that? So we try to, um, every time we have, uh, for example, uh, last weekend, I don't know if, if any, how many of you actually followed Collingwood, um, but uh, Liz uh, Dunn, who works uh, runs community at Collingwood Football Club, she informed me about a young fella who uh, had a serious brain injury. He's four years old, big Collingwood fan, um, and it was his birthday coming up for his fifth birthday. Uh, he was still in Ronald McDonald House, but um, we actually did a Zoom meeting where we got the boys to sing happy birthday to him. So it took five minutes out of our day, but for him, he got to record it and it's something that he got to keep and the boys sent him some messages. So 
um, that's part of care. One of our values at the club is care. And that's a behavior or an action that actually came from that that reinforces that. Um, and it goes both ways. I mean, if there's something to do with care and we get it wrong, we need to go back and go, hang on, that, that wasn't the action that we expect um, to do with our values. And then on-field versus off-field expectations. And I think a lot of that comes more down to um, the actual players you work with and the staff you work with because your players and your staff will pick things up before the leader does so uh, uh, more often than what the leader does because they're not in those little conversations. This guy got picked in front of this guy or he's, he's not happy about it. And he starts actually filtering through or she starts filtering through and saying, oh, the coach doesn't know what they're doing. They said this, they said that. The players will pick up on that before the coach does or before it gets to the coach. So it's really important that expectations around um, selection, around how you go about it, um, that you touch on that. I'm just going to show you uh, this short video. Um, it's something that I saw a couple of years ago. I don't follow NBA basketball. It doesn't matter if you don't follow it. Um, but this is a guy, uh, his name is Dwayne Wade. Um, and hopefully it's going to work. If it doesn't, um, I'm sure one of you can jump on and just tell me, but hopefully it works and it goes for about three minutes and it's about legacy. We haven't got any sound there, Nick, so... That. What, what I might do is I might um I might actually send I'll send the uh, link. We can certainly share the link with people. So I'll, yeah, I'll send you the link and then you can share it out because I think it's um yeah it's something that's definitely worth um thinking about. So sounds uh, good. That was the last thing I was going to actually go through. So um yeah, I'm happy to sort of where are we next, Ryan? You want to take some questions or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've got about 10 minutes until the Adelaide-Melbourne game, so certainly got time to open up the floor if anyone has any questions. We don't have anything in the chat boxes of yet, but um, if anyone would like to ask Nick any questions or would like to make any comments, please feel free now. If you don't know how to comment, uh, it's next to the hand. It's uh, the box there with the, the arrow down. All very quiet on the comment front at the moment. So I think <laughs> everyone's taking what they need. <laughs> Perfect. Don't be shy. We'll give uh, another 30 seconds if anyone has any questions. I know we've, uh, the hour has just come up, but um, yeah, if anyone has any uh, questions they'd like to ask before we finish up, that'd be great. Uh, just one here from Stephen Richards. Uh, what is the best piece of advice uh, you've received during your career? Uh, best part of advice? Um, well, from a football perspective, uh, it probably came from a guy called James Clement. And it's not the way uh, you traditionally receive feedback. Um, as I mentioned, I had that osteitis pubis injury. Um, and my first year at Collingwood, I was going to my second pre so my second pre-season, going to my second year. And for that injury, you'd get tight back, tight hammies, tight groins. And the physios would always come and check on you. And I'd say, no, I'm pretty tight here. I'm sore here. Um, so they'd take you off and, and take you in so that it wouldn't break in, you wouldn't break down. Um, he actually came in and uh, I won't use all the words that he used because uh, we want to make sure this is PG, but he was uh, very strong in his feedback to me about um, me being soft, uh, not pushing the limits, not um, – he basically he said to me, if you don't get out there, and push through that and either you either rip your hammy off the bone and you'll find out where your limit is or you'll never reach that limit and you're never going to make it. And I was absolutely gutted because he was the guy I looked up to. He was the guy who played a position similar to me um, and for him to say that. So actually, I rang my old man and I was actually on the verge of tears and he said, well, why do you think he said it? And I said, well, he obviously thinks I'm soft. He thinks that I'm, I'm pulling out and taking the easy, the easy route. And he said, well, are you? And for me to have that sort of mirror put up in front of me, it was more, it wasn't that I was taking the, the easy, um, I guess the, the easy road. It was more that I didn't know my body. I didn't know what I was capable of, but you've got to try and find out yourself and work out what those limits are. And so from then on, I, every time the physio came out, I was like, nah, I'm fine. Nah, I'm fine. I never even said I was tired or sore because I didn't want to, I guess, embarrass myself or, or let, I'd rather tear the hammy <laughs> than, than find that out. And I actually never found that limit. I never got to the point where 
I was so tired that I tore something. I, now I, I tore muscles later on in my career, but um, it wasn't to do with the work rate. And I got so much fitter because I was doing so much work and I became a better player. So um, it was really, uh, it was great advice to me. It wasn't probably the way it was between the eyes. So it's not quite often the way that you want to get advice, but it was really important for me at that time. That's good. And I've got a few more questions here for you as well, Nick. Next one's from yeah. Donna. Uh, what was the hardest moment that you felt defined you as a leader? Hardest moment that defined me as a leader? Uh, that's a great question, Donna. Um, uh, look, it probably, um, obviously, when we drew the grand final was really hard um, because, and those those who obviously watched the game would have seen how shattered I was after the game and probably spoke my mind a little bit too much. But um, I, after that game, uh, everyone was out in the ground for ages and a lot of people didn't realise that um, it wasn't because we were going to 10 minutes each way or that we were arguing with the AFL about playing the toilet and the sewage had backed up in our rooms and flooded our whole rooms with sewage. So we couldn't actually go back to our change rooms. Um, so 18 players from each team got taken to the other change rooms on the other side and myself and three of my teammates and four St Kilda players had had our, na- our names picked out for drug testing. Um, so I actually had to go down to that room because um, that's where it was all set up and all the official stuff was. And I was that sort of cooked because it was a hot day. I was that tired. It took me an hour and a half to, to wee my 90 mils. Um, and everyone had gone by the time I came out. And all I had was my car keys. So I didn't have, I was still in my full playing kit. They'd taken my bag. Um, and I walked out onto the ground and uh, there was just clean as it was dark. It was just clean as the spotlights all around the MCG. And I just thought, how, how are we possibly going to bounce back from this? Um, and I went, I got my car and I drove back to the club and I was walking past um, our altitude room, which is just a little room with a couple of treadmills and a couple of bikes. And I heard people running on the treadmill and, and I saw, well, what is going on here? Like, who would have the energy to do that? And I opened the door and it was Tyson Goldsack and Tarkin Lockyer. And that were two emergencies for, for that grand final. And they actually high-fived each other, I swear. As I opened the door, they were on the treaty next to each other and they high-fived each other and they were laughing and like chatting to each other and their body language was up. And I just thought these two guys that would have the toughest, basically the toughest thing you'd ever be told is that you're the two guys who are going to miss out. You're the closest to being in a grand final team, but you're out. And now the door was ajar for them. In a week's time, we're going to play another grand final. So it wasn't over. It was, there was a chance. Like the door was open again for them. And it was an opportunity lost. It was opportunity postponed. And that sort of seeing them change my whole mindset. And I grabbed the boys together and said, boys, it's, it's half time. We're going to talk about half time. Mick talked about that that night, that this is about um, what we can achieve next week. And on the Monday morning, um, Mick actually said to me at the end of the meeting, is there anything from you, Nick, after we'd done his review? And I said, yeah, I know a lot of guys are, are really hurting about the way they performed on the weekend. I think we had five guys out of 22 um, get a vote in our best and fairest. So usually um, you should lose by a lot. Um, and I said, boys, if you played a bad game on the weekend, if you come out, do your job this week and we win, no one will ever remember what happened last week. No one will ever remember that you played badly in the grand final. Um, I know Scotty, Penny, Scotty Pendlebridge from Gippsland, uh, he'd been crook during that week. Um, obviously played a poor grand final. He's not remembered for that. He's remembered for being a Northsmith medalist the next week when you went out and won the premiership. So, um, yeah, I guess that week um, and trying to get the energy up and trying to change the mindset was probably something, Donna, that um, that really, um, I guess, helped define me a bit. Sounds good. We've got a few more questions. If people are happy to stick around for a little while, I might keep attacking a few of these. So next question is from Holly, and it's how would you approach trying to change culture within a committee or executive committee when you're at the bottom of the food chain? So when you actually need the, the leaders to actually change your way? Um, well, this video is a good start that I'm going to send you about legacy. I think that um, too often um, you can get – people have been in positions for a long time. Um, they tend to do things the same and they're not thinking about what's next, what's next. Um, so I think quite often you can have – you can pull them aside one-on-one, just have a conversation about how did you start out, what did you learn. When you were in my position, who was only more junior on a committee, um, how did you get your opinions across? Uh, how did you feel? Did you feel you were valued early on? So you can actually take them back to when they were in the position that you're in um, and make them realise that, oh, actually, or maybe now that I've been on this committee for 10 years or 20 years or whatever it is, I've got to remember that the person coming in after one year 
that their their vote is just as important as my vote and their their opinion. They're here for a reason. So I think if you can actually sh- um, get them to share some of their stories about some of their experiences and talk about well, how is how has this club changed over the years? What are, which parts changed for the better? Which things did you think this is never going to help us? Um, and all of a sudden, it's made a huge impact. And uh, I mean, a real obvious one is um, female football. So if you go back 30 years, no one on a committee would ever, they laughed at it. Oh, we don't want women playing football. And now um, the what it's done to clubs, the culture of clubs, um, in, inclusion, it's just been unbelievable for everyone. And that's from Collingwood at, a, at that level, um, at a professional level all the way down to, to grassroots. So I think if you can just get them thinking about the changes that they've been a part of and they've experienced, we'll give them an understanding of some of the things that maybe when you make a suggestion that um, that could be the difference in 10 years' time that they didn't see like a women's, a women's uh, AFL team coming in. Sounds good. Um, and this next question from Carly is pretty similar, but it's going the other way to your players. So how do you respond to anyone that doesn't toe the line with regards to culture in your team? Yeah, you've got to make your call. Uh, it's, it's a hard one. I mean, to give you an example, um, when we would talk about alcohol consumption, uh, when, when I was captain of the team, um, we'd go, right, oh, well, what are the rules? And we'd sit around as a group and we'd agree to the rules. And I'd go to Swanee or to any of the guys who I thought might be a little bit more of a challenge on that. And I'd say, can you live up to this? Don't just nod your head now. This is your chance to say, if you believe in it, we're all in. If you don't believe in it, then let me know. Um, and Dane uh, is actually, despite the fact people perceive us as being so different, he's a really good mate of mine, and um, we had a great relationship, despite the fact that he probably went out a little bit more than I did, um, but he also, I had to confront him at one stage when he did break one of those rules, I had to suspend him for two weeks, because that was our team rule, and it cost him his second Brownlow medal, he, he finished two votes off uh, in, in a Brownlow medal count, uh, and he got suspended for two games when he was in the best form of his career, we won both those games, um, which would have meant he, he would have been in the votes. He only needed two more and he would have had a second brown low. So um, having to actually confront and have those conversations, I think if people, um, if you're happy to sit down with people respectfully and just go, mate, you know, these are the rules that we came up with um, or these are our team rules or this is how your actions affect the rest of the group. It's not just about this is right, this is wrong. It's the flow and effect of what happens with this. And I think if you really speak to people about that, they're going to understand it from your perspective and when you put it from your perspective. Um, and at the same time, if they don't, then that probably tells you enough enough about them and whether or not they're willing to be part of or to bend to a culture um, that is there for everyone. It's not just there for them. So you're probably better off moving on. Beautiful. Now, I know you've done quite a bit of work across Collingwood and in all the different departments, both the men's and foot, uh, women's football teams. A couple of questions. One from Kirsty in regards to advice for those wanting to take their coaching career further, especially as a female. And also one from uh, Longy, with the advent of females in the game, what is the best piece of advice for keeping them interested? Uh, it's a two-part question. Is there any difference with the youth female and what suggestions you have to provide the pathway of ownership for them? Yeah, I think the youth female um, coming through, they've probably had more experience um, than those who came in uh, a, a bit later um, because they've actually been through a few pathways. So they realise, I guess, the professionalism that is required when you start making um, those sort of those better teams as you go through. Um, so we've found at Collingwood the last couple of years, our draftees have often been the ones driving the standards and training the hardest and coming and doing all the extra work. So it's making them understand that um, or make, making them feel supported because you can get um, the girls who have been around a long time. All of a sudden, they might feel a bit threatened about these other ones coming through. So I think it's important you're pretty open and honest with everyone. Um, our, we've had some great um, work with our senior uh, female uh, players at Collingwood who have actually adapted so well to the changing professionalism. And I think that's just part of the conversation is that these are the expectations. It's not your fault that that's the level you're at. It's just that's what you grew up with. But what can we do to improve that? And how can we actually work that through and try and be better? Um, in terms of coaching, I think that there's a lot of things you can do. The first thing is you can go and watch different training sessions. So if you're if you're a female who wants to get into AFL or you're a female who wants to get into um, AFLW as an example, go and watch training sessions because so many of the training sessions, I mean, unfortunately for us, fortunately and unfortunately, we're in a great location but we're a public space. So anyone can watch any training session we ever have. So um, there's one little piece of advice for you. You can go and watch us anytime uh, we're actually training and it's pretty easy to work out what the schedule looks like. So 
Um, you can work out what the coaches are saying, how they're coaching, what sort of drills they're doing. Um, and obviously from, uh, from as you work your way up, I think volunteering is important as well. So it might just be what's the next level above where I am. I might be coaching under 16. So you go, right, I want to go uh, help the under 18s out or just kick the balls back and just notice what they're doing and take notes of it. I might go and help the seniors. Can I just be a fly on the wall? Just ask the senior coach, can I just be a fly on the wall one day and just listen to what you're talking about, sitting in your meetings. So it's just gaining little bits of experience as you go. Um, and, and speaking to those who have that experience as well. So reaching out to the senior coach at your local club and saying, well, um, any chance you can grab a coffee? I just want to find out about your pathway and the advice you've had and, and things that have helped you along your journey. Sounds good. Um, you were just mentioning talking to Tyson and Tarkin when, um, after the grand final. Um, and I think it was maybe Tyson went in and Leon came out maybe from memory for, yep. for the game afterwards. Question from um, Tom O'Connor. As captain, how did you support teammates that missed out on, on the selected team? Yeah, it's a really hard one. Um, I think you just got to be open and up front and understand that um, no matter what you say, they're hurt. You can't, you can't change it with words. You can't change it with support. Um, all you can do is be there. It's going to be through uh, it was hard for me because some of the guys I came through who were my closest mates in the club were Tark and Lockyer, um, Josh Fraser, Shane O'Brien, Simon Prestigiacomo, um, and all those guys were on the list that year and they missed out on being part of it. And and they were the guys who helped us get to that position. They helped develop a lot of us. They helped made us better players. And they didn't get to wear the jumper on that one day. So it's really hard. Um, it's As I said, you're never going to get... Um, anything you say or any support you give them isn't going to help. It's just a process they've got to go through themselves. But all we can do is be open and honest with them and just say, listen, I know this isn't going to help you. Um, I know that you, anything I say is irrelevant, but I want you to know that you've helped me. I wish you were out there with me, but this is a process we have to go through and you can only select 22. Fair enough. And I've just got a couple more questions before I let you off the hook. Um, next yep. one is from Grant and, um, it's around having difficult conversations. Can you give an example of a time where someone benefited or excelled after a difficult conversation with you as, as a captain of Collingwood? Yeah, well, I guess um, a, a guy we've got called Ben Reid, um, he actually, I guess, got the James Clement um, conversation that I experienced. I passed that on to him and uh, he spoke about it last year to me because he had that conversation with another player. So it sort of went full circle as, as you go through it. But um, we played in 2010, actually, we played Brisbane up at the Gabba and uh, Favola and Jonathan Brown were, were going off. Um, Presti and Ben Reid were our two key position defenders and I was on, I was sort of a third tall. And um, Reedy got moved off one of the key positions instead of, they, they flipped him for a start and then that didn't work. So they moved him onto a different player and I had to play way out of my depth and height and size and all that. And I'd have a conversation with him on the Monday. I said, mate, you are in this team to be a key position player. Now, we think you're good enough. You've got to believe in yourself and you've got to understand that your job is to do that. So your job is to play on Fev or to play on Brownie. And we think you can be the, the best defender in the league. But unless you're going to believe it, unless you're going to actually do the extra work needed, then you're not going to, you're not going to be part of the team. So um, he, I guess when I had that conversation, I wasn't thinking about the James Clement one that, that I had had. And I wasn't thinking about um, what influence that might have on him or I was just being open and honest with him about what I need from him in the team. So um, I guess he speaks to that, that that was something that helped him. Beautiful. And just one question to finish off. I'm going to um, put two together. One from Joe is asking, what do you think are the best traits of a great coach that you have had? And um, another one down here was from Craig, who as leaders have inspired you the most? So talking about traits and who has inspired you. Yeah, good questions again. Um, who has inspired me? Um, well, well, I mean, from the, the the ones I mentioned about my mentors and the journey that they gave me, they, they all inspired me in different ways and they all sort of supported me on my journey. Um, I think in terms of inspiration, there's a lot of different people that you come across um, in life who, have, who inspire us. And um, we had a, a young um, Indigenous boy who... Uh, who, who we met probably two years ago now. He died um, not long ago. Um, and we you would have seen on Channel 7, we actually had him to the game. Um, he, had, he had a brain um, cancer. And the boys carried him off the ground on their shoulders. Um, he was part of our uh, song when we sung the song. Um, so 
he inspired me. Uh, his parents inspired me, the fact that they were doing everything they could to help um, their son, I guess, in the last 12 months of his life, knowing that he was going to die. Um, I saw a, a click on, I'm not sure if he's still here, but I saw a guy click on this uh, thing when the names were coming up named Bo Vernon. Um, he's a guy who inspired me. Uh, I went in, uh, he's one of Brent McCaffrey's good mates, and he asked me to go in and see him when he was in um, his rehab and what he's done and the way he's gone on to become a, a great coach and a successful coach. He's inspired me, and I've never seen, I've never even spoken to him about that or said it to him, but um, inspiration comes in so many different ways, and um, I even see it with uh, a lot of the mums at the moment who are a lot of our, um, because we're away from home um, and because we hadn't been with our families over the last five or six weeks, watching them look after the home life, look after the kids, look at them um, work with uh, t the schooling, do all the, the, the schooling at home. Um, I, I can't believe how they do all that and how they uh, bring it all together. So they inspire. So I think that there's, there's inspiration everywhere um, and you just got to keep thinking about I think you've always got your LeBron James and your Michael Jordan and your Tom Brady and all those type of people. But in reality, the ones that really inspire and the ones that really leave a, a legacy and an impact um, are the ones that you actually meet face to face who aren't seen as those great superstars or have had these amazing careers. It's the ones that you actually touch you and you get to learn something from them. Yeah, sounds great. Well, I might let you off the hook there. Thanks for all your insights there, Nick. And David, I'll pass it back to you to wind it up. Yeah, look, Ryan, we won't take too much time, but just wanted to thank both you, Ryan, and uh, Nick for your insights tonight. Uh, I think it's been a fantastic session and evident by how many people have hung around, you know, well over the hour and, and listened in and the, the, the questions have come thick and fast because uh, people have really been engaged in what both of you had to say. So a lot to take away from us as, um, you know, for our club, our workplace and our self-development as well. And you've touched on so much stuff around inclusion and building positive uh, negatives into positives um, you know about mentors and giving us some, some good homework and stuff to think about over the next few days and to take back to our clubs when we finally get back to play as well so thank you very much Nick and thanks Ryan and Nick all the best with Collingwood over the rest of the season and, and, and being away from home as well it's being in lockdown it's probably nothing you're missing here in Melbourne so um, <laughs> in, enjoy your resort up there um, I would say to everyone that's left, and, and we will get the recordings out to people, but we do have another three great sessions. So next week we've got uh, Shani Layton speaking on building positive relationships between players and coach. So it um, should be another great uh, session. So, again, thanks to Nick and Ryan, and uh, we look forward to seeing everyone uh, next Wednesday night as well. So thanks. Thanks, guys. Have a good day.